Hello and uh, welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is the second episode in the Head to Head series where we juxtapose some of the evidence. In this episode, we're going to look at the Sun article and we're going to compare it to Amber's op-ed. Now, in their respective opening arguments, which I juxtaposed and published in the first video in the series a few days ago, we heard Johnny Depp being asked why I was here in court. Anyone know the answer to that? Anyone know what Johnny said when he was asked, why are you here? Why are you here in court? Well, in a nutshell, why is Depp suing Heard? Well, if you paid attention to Depp's answer to why he was in court, he didn't refer to Amber's op-ed published on December 18, 2018. Bear in mind, Depp filed his lawsuit just three months later, three months after the op-ed was written on March, in March 2019. So the timing is certainly interesting, isn't it? If Johnny didn't explicitly mention the op-ed in his rambling eight-minute opening, his lawsuit did. Point one, on page one, under the section, Nature of the Action. So if this is why, if I mean, if this document is the reason why it's bringing the lawsuit, then why not say that? But instead of citing this as his reason for suing Amber Heard, Depp spoke vaguely of heinous criminal acts and that Amber had made against him six years ago. Six years ago. The op-ed was written less than four years ago. I suppose Depp may be referring to claims Heard made about him when they got divorced, which is six years ago this month if we go by the date it was filed. In that declaration filed on May 27, 2016, Heard made claims of mistreatment during the quote-unquote entirety of their relationship. But why were those claims then not opposed then? She also described Johnny's relationship with reality oscillating based on the substances he was using. That's her word, oscillating. Oscillate means swing, sway, or swing back and forth. The document goes on to provide a detailed narrative, clearly at the time that she was married, of the backstory of the scenes and scenarios precipitating the divorce. This was documented and written six years ago, so this uh, the uh, divorce filing was written six years ago, and I think that answers the question to some extent about how Amber is able to recall these events so many years later. How is she able to recall these events now? Well, six years ago, she had to document them. She had to sit down with her lawyers and put pen to paper. Yes, the rub. If these claims were mere allegations and if they weren't true, why didn't Johnny oppose them then? Six years ago, why didn't he file the lawsuit he's filing now? If he's sitting in court six years later and he's asked, you know, why are you here? And he's saying the reason he's here is because of something that was written in the divorce document, which, and he doesn't reference that directly either. He doesn't say something she said in the divorce document. Then it seems as if the op-ed doesn't feature very high on his list of how, what, and when he was defamed. She might say, again, what is Johnny Depp unhappy about? Why is he in court? What is it all about? Well, he doesn't say so directly in his opening statement, but the document that is his um, lawsuit does say so directly. And so why is there that discrepancy? Then we go to Amber Heard. When Amber Heard was asked the same question during her testimony in chief, she answered the question immediately and directly. Why are you here? Well, this is her answer. Now, why are you here? I am here because my ex-husband is suing me uh, for an op-ed I wrote. All of this is just an introduction to the issue I really want to address here, which is quite simply the tone, content, and context of the Sun article versus the tone, content, and context of Heard's op-ed. And as a journalist, as a writer, 
um, that is something that I very um, that I notice. I notice what is the length of an article, what does it look like, what is the um, point of it you know what is the person trying to convey because i've got to think about that when i write articles for magazines um, what tone am i going to take uh, what tone do i need to take for a particular publication uh, what am i trying to communicate how can i communicate it effectively and so yeah we have two articles and i'm quite a good person i think to interrogate that as a not only a journalist and a photojournalist, but also an investigative reporter, uh, an investigative analytical person, and someone who's also studied the law. So um, what I'm going to illustrate as simply as I possibly can is that the Sun article was the subject of a lawsuit two years ago, which Johnny Depp lost, right? So we're going to look at one article that was the subject of a lawsuit. It led to Johnny Depp um, suing uh, the publication or the publication company and uh, Johnny Depp lost that. Now we have the same thing taking place with another article and so what you want to do is look at the article. And so let me present this hypothesis to you guys before we actually do that. Um, if we juxtapose the two articles and we are about to do that, but let's say we juxtapose the two articles, and let's say for the sake of argument, the op-ed has more egregious claims, more serious slurs, um, you know, it's just um, a, a, a lot more uh, toxic and insulting and whatever, um, not based in any species of reality to use his parlance, right? Then we can understand that there might be legitimate grounds for defamation, but what if, on the other hand, when the articles are placed head-to-head, -head, what if one of the articles is much milder in turn than the other? Is it logical to assume the milder of the two articles, if the milder article is the op-ed, will have the substance, the meat and potatoes necessary to justify a defamation ruling when the Sun article didn't? What do you think? So let me ask it in another way. Do you think the op-ed, if it is milder, since this is what the whole thing is based on, this is why we're here, do you think that will justify a defamation ruling ultimately? In other words, do you think the op-ed will lead to a ruling in Johnny Depp's favor? And as I say, you need to think about it in the context of another article that was that led to a ruling that wasn't in his favor. And so let's look at them head to head. Head to head, side by side, we can see, we can make a few obvious observations. We have an image of Johnny Depp as an evil character um, appearing in a sort of mosaic on the, uh, that the sun have used. Um, it also places an image of Amber's face that most people don't believe to be bruised. And she, her face is right beside his. But you can, you can see what they're trying to convey just in terms of word, uh, uh, pictures. And then the words then extend that impression um, and, and also kind of confirm it and verify what the pictures are trying to illustrate. Does that make sense? And so you have this picture of Amber kind of looking down towards Depp, her face is directed towards him. And does Johnny Depp look like a nice guy or does he look angry? Does he look kind of unhinged? What do you think about the picture that they've used of Johnny Depp, right? And then it doesn't end there. You've got to look at those pictures, uh, including the one of Depp as a dark wizard, Gellert Grindelwald, um, that is also beside an image of a, a photograph of the franchise owner, the creator, the person really involved in making these films that Johnny Depp appears in. Amber Heard doesn't appear in them. Johnny Depp appears in them. Right? And so it actually is bringing in a filmmaker and kind of saying, why are you casting or why are you still casting this particular actor 
in your franchise? Should you be doing it? And that question has financial implications for Johnny Depp, right? It's very on the chin, isn't it? And so under this image, this collage of images, a title refers directly by name, um, refers to Johnny Depp. Um, his name is mentioned in the title. And in the title also is criticism about the decision to cast Johnny Depp in a film that's also named It's Fantastic Beasts. And so could you be more explicit than that? Uh, why are you casting Johnny Depp in Fantastic Beasts? And then the article goes on to kind of explicate that in more detail. So that is the Sun piece. And as we know, Johnny Depp took that publication to court and lost. Now let's contrast that with Amber Heard's op-ed. And wh wh what do we see there? It features only a photo of herself. And the most objectionable, objectionable term in her title is violence, which without context doesn't seem to go anywhere specific, nor does it seem directed at anyone in particular. Does that make sense? So based just on the respective titles and images in, this, uh, in these respective articles, who would you say or which article would you say is milder? So in a contest between these two articles, just based on titles and images, which one would you say is the milder of the two? Now let's move on to content. So here's the opening paragraph from Dan Wooten's article. It reads as follows, quote, For a holier-than-thou Twitterati preacher, J.K. Rowling tries to present herself as a leading light for women in the entertaining industry. Uh, entertainment industry, but the author will need to use every trick in Harry Potter's magic book to handle the growing outrage in Hollywood over her decision to stand by the casting of Johnny Depp in the lead role in her precious Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them franchise. Can you can you uh, see the, the scathing, undermining, cynical tone? Just in, it's like dripping with sarcasm in this particular writer's opening sentences. And now let's juxtapose that with Amber Heard's opening paragraph. She says, I was exposed to mistreatment at a very young age. I knew certain things early on without ever having to be told. I knew that men have the power physically, socially, and financially, and that a lot of institutions support that arrangement. I knew this long before I had the words to articulate it, and I bet you learned it young too. That's the end of the section. So again, based on the respective names, references, tones, intentions expressed in these respective opening paragraphs, which one would you say is milder? I can go on all day. I can go through paragraph by paragraph, step by step. Both of these articles are almost the same length. The sun's is slightly longer. But I'll leave uh, that to those who really want to find out for themselves. I'll put um, a link to both of these in the description, um, assuming you haven't read it already. I think another thing that is an issue is I think the Washington Post is be behind a paywall. So I don't know how many of you can read that article if you really want to. Having said that, if it is behind a paywall, then it shows you that fewer people could read that article. So what is the, the reach then? So just in terms of that, if the one article is behind a paywall and the other is not, how can one talk about um, the one being milder than the other in terms of if you can't actually read it, then the, the reach of the article is less. And so the um, apparently the deleterious impact has to be less as well. So, as I say, you can read it on your own. You can compare paragraph to paragraph piecemeal, uh, but also compare the whole, the whole thing and see what you think about it and try and be as objective as you can. I mean, think, forget about everything else. Just compare what has been written here because this is the substance. This article, these articles were the substance of two respective court cases. So maybe we should examine them. Maybe you should get to know that. 
Now, in theory, we could also go head to head to head with a third article published in Rolling Stone. So you could say, if Johnny Depp is really upset by what is written about him, can we find something that is even milder than this or even worse than this, right? And to be honest, I didn't go searching for something like that. I didn't like go, I'm going to try and find the worst thing I can find about him. I was simply doing research and I stumbled upon this article in Rolling Stone. And it went on and on and on. And the part that really stood out to me was the fact that there was so much information, so much incredibly detailed precise, descriptive information available in this magazine on Johnny Depp on June 21st, 2018. And it clearly is predated by the Sun piece. And we, so we could also use the same technique comparing the text and imagery and the opening paragraph. And so place side by side by side which of the three articles is the harshest now and which the mildest, would you say? Just looking at it superficially at face value. What do you think? The Rolling Stone article is long form and spans well over 10,000 words. I think it's 10,300 and something. The Sun has just over 1,000 words and Herd's article is still the shortest of the three at just 831 words. And so if word count were a measure of severity, you know, often when you're upset or angry or you've got a lot to say, you say a lot. And so if word count is a measure of severity, if quantity is a way to assuage emotion or intent, how do you think Heard's article does on that score? The Rolling Stone piece has really got to be read to be believed. It's the only article which deals in detail and specifics of a direct 72-hour encounter with Depp, quoting him repeatedly, verbatim, and providing uh, excruciating detail, color, and context, um, description at some length of Depp at home and being with him in his home. The article touches on his empty bank accounts. Those are words from the article, his bank accounts being empty, and this was, bear in mind, four years ago. Um, A quote from the article reads, It's estimated that Depp has made $650 million on films that netted $3.6 billion. Almost all of it is gone. And as I say, those words, almost all of this money is gone. Those were written four years ago. It also refers to Depp suing the management group run by his longtime business manager, as well as his brother Robert. And so just in short, yes, he was also suing his brother. The article also, um, there's a quote from the article, also says, quote, Over the past 18 months, there's been little but bad news for Depp. In addition to the financial woes, there were reports he couldn't remember his lines and had to have them fed to him through an earpiece. Um, it also talks about him splitting with his longtime lawyer and agent, uh, describing him as being alone, you know, that a lot of people that he's worked with are now no longer working with him or he's not working with them. It refers to his tabloid scarred divorce and um, persuasive allegations of mistreatment. Um, and so this is all in the news four years ago. It was in the ether four years ago. The Stone writer describes Depp during his encounter as sometimes incoherent and having a hunted look about him. And this specificity also comes out regarding his finances. This is precise, this is this precise detail that the article is full of. So another quote from the article reads, quote, Depp lived an ultra extravagant lifestyle that often knowingly cost Depp in excess of $2 million a month to maintain, which he simply could not afford. I think you get the point. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't want to get the point. But regardless, the point is quite easily explained and demonstrated. You've just got to do a bit of reading. You've got to think a little bit as well. Um, 
But th- this is something that I think is really interesting. When Depp and Heard's divorce was finalized, they issued the following joint statement to the media and the public at large. And this is quoting from Pictons.com. It's a solicitor um, it's a group of solicitors. Despite the explosive nature of their split, they released a bizarre joint statement claiming that their relationship was, quote, intensely passionate and at times volatile, but always bound by love. Neither party has made false accusations for financial gain. There was never any intent of physical or emotional harm, end quote. So even their joint statement after their divorce to the public, to the media, acknowledges an intense and volatile relationship. That's not in dispute. And so much for either of them making accusations or not making accusations for financial gain. I mean, this lawsuit is expressly about one gaining at the expense of the other. And as for no intent of physical or emotional harm, there have been endless scenes, images and texts painting a different story in court. And so why mention it? Why there was never any intention of physical or emotional harm? Why mention it if it wasn't a factor? Isn't it because it was a factor? Isn't it common cause that despite what they said, that there was never any physical or emotional harm? Isn't it quite clear that there was, kind of from both sides? You might say more from this side or more from that side, but isn't it pretty clear that that is the case, despite what was said in that statement. The idiosyncratic feature of our time, of course, is that we choose whatever we want to believe. We choose the reality that we like. We choose the reality that suits us. We choose the reality that we want, irrespective of what it actually is. The jury don't have that luxury. Or maybe this case will show that they do. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.